O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Let each one of us seek Jehovah's blessing upon this service in a moment of silent prayer. Beloved congregation in our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of Jehovah who made heaven and earth. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God the Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sister has one announcement tonight, and that is that the pre-confession class will be held tonight. The pre-confession class will meet after church tonight. We continue our worship singing psalter number 140, 140, a song of expressing really a prayer to God for mercy. God, be merciful to me on thy grace, I rest my plea. Plenteous in compassion, thou blot out my transgressions now. We sing all the stanzas 140.
Let us together make confession of our Catholic undoubted Christian faith, each one saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our scripture reading tonight is Psalm 130. Psalm 130. A brief psalm, and the text is the first three verses of the psalm, Psalm 130. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say, more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So far we read God's holy word. We sing together Psalter number 150. 150. O Lord, give thou ear to my plea, and hide not thyself from my cry. O hearken, and answer thou me, as restless and weary I sigh. The four stanzas, 150. Thank you.
this preparatory service, we turn to the form for the administration of the Lord's Supper and read that portion of the form that deals with self-examination of ourselves, found on page 91 in the back of the Psalter. We begin then in the second column. The true examination of ourselves consists of these three parts. First, that everyone consider by himself his sins and the curse due to him for them, to the end that he may abhor and humble himself before God, considering that the wrath of God against sin is so great that, rather than it should go unpunished, he hath punished the same in his beloved Son, Jesus Christ, with a bitter and shameful death of the cross. Secondly, that everyone examine his own heart, whether he doth believe the faithful promise of God that all his sins are forgiven him only for the sake of the passion and death of Jesus Christ, and that the perfect righteousness of Christ is imputed and freely given him as his own, yea, so perfectly, as if he had satisfied in his own person for all his sins and fulfilled all righteousness. Thirdly, that everyone examine his own conscience, whether he purposeth henceforth to show true thankfulness to God in his whole life, and to walk uprightly before him, as also whether he hath laid aside unfeignedly all enmity, hatred, and envy, and doth firmly resolve henceforward to walk in true love and peace with his neighbor. All those then who are thus disposed, God will certainly receive in mercy and count them worthy partakers of the table of his Son, Jesus Christ. On the contrary, those who do not feel this testimony in their hearts eat and drink judgment to themselves. So far we read the form. Let us bow before our God in congregational prayer. Father in heaven, we bow before thee, casting our burden upon thee, with the certain confidence that all our cries do rise up before thy throne. They arise before thy throne not because we have the right in ourselves not because we are worthy of being heard, not because what we say is so important or so well put, but they arise before thy throne because of thy Son, Jesus Christ, who takes our prayers and perfects them and removes that which is sinful and adds what is left out and brings them as the perfect mediator before the throne of the Almighty God. And because of his work, his work on the cross, his work as mediator now, our prayers arise before thee as a sweet incense. They are pleasing. That's the testimony of thy word. That as a father... Thou dost delight in the cries of thy children when we call upon thee. We are commanded to do this. Call upon me, thou dost command us, and I will hear. That's thy promise to us. This is so precious to know that every cry that we lift up before thee, thou dost hear. And as a father delights in the voice of his children, thou dost delight to hear us. So we cast our burdens upon thee tonight, the burden of our sorrows, the burden of the grief in a loss of one that thou hast taken suddenly from us. We bring before thee, Lord, the needs of the Bomer's family, knowing that thou alone art able to lift them up. 
that thou alone art able to give them the strength, give them the comfort, give them the ability to put their trust and confidence in thee. Lord, this is a heavy blow that thou hast brought upon them and thou hast brought upon us as a congregation. And we bring, therefore, before thee all our needs. We ask that thy grace and spirit is given in rich abundance, and that we can find in thee the promise fulfilled that thou wilt never leave or forsake thy people. The promises that all things that happen to us never ever come by chance. And they never come without purpose. That thou in thy mercy and goodness has planned the life of each and every one of us. And that our lives are so directed by thee that everything, everything in them works for our good. And at the same time, for thy glory. Because as it works for our good, we understand that this is our eternal good. This is for our spiritual strengthening. This is to prepare us for our place in heaven. When we take the place in the multitude that cannot be numbered, prepared exactly as thou hast determined by every experience, by every joy, by every sorrow, prepared exactly for the place that thou hast determined for each and every one of us. Different, unique, special. And all the experiences of life are preparing us and bringing us home. Lord, give us the grace and give the family the grace too to be able to say with Job, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And blessed be the name of our God. We do bless thee, but we bring our burdens to thee and cast them upon thee and ask for strength to go forward. We bring before thee the burden not only of sorrow, but of guilt, the guilt of our own sin. For we are sinful. Our best work is but a filthy rag. We would never ever dare to bring anything that we have done before thy throne for approval. And many times we walk in sin. Many times our thoughts and minds are not inclined to heaven, but heaven is the farthest thing from our mind. We're on the earth, on the things of this earth, on the treasures and the pleasures and the possessions of this earth. And so little time we have for the things that are heavenly and spiritual, the things that are the only things that are important in life. We confess our sin. We confess our sinfulness. That it's our very nature to be so inclined. In fact, worse, it is inclined to hate thee. To despise the things that are heavenly. To hate even those that are around us in the, in the household of faith. And to use everything and everyone only for our own sinful pleasures and exaltation. We confess our sinfulness. We bring, therefore, all our needs and our cares and our troubles and our guilt to the throne of Jesus Christ and lay them down there, knowing that he has paid for our sins in his cross. And that as a merciful high priest, he looks upon us, not despising us, not abhorring us, 
not ashamed of us, but that he considers us in love, the same love that he has that led him to give himself for our sins to the shameful and bitter death of the cross. And that he receives us, therefore, in mercy, that he brings to thee also the plea to forgive us and to wash us in the spirit and blood of Jesus Christ and to comfort us. We ask, therefore, Lord, for that blessing and pray that this is given to us that we may be able to worship thee, to bring our praises to thee, to offer our alms as tokens of our thankfulness, to be able to worship and exalt thy name. We will add nothing to thy glory, absolutely nothing, we never will. But we do desire to praise thee in a way that is right and proper. So keep us from every sin even here. Give us a rich measure of the Spirit so that we have wisdom that we have understanding, that we are able to draw near to thy word, that word is as an open book to us tonight, that the Spirit gives us wisdom and understanding. Bless thy servant. Use him tonight as an instrument in thy hand to lead us in worship, not only, but to bring the word, especially the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that he with us may be edified by the word, and that together we may bring forth a sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise to thee. Lord, uphold us in our daily walk. Bless our homes and families. Grant that there in our homes the love of Christ rules. Keep our marriages firm, strong, That as husbands and wives, we are devoted to each other. Bless those who live without a husband and wife because thou hast taken through death others who are reminded even by the events of this week of their own loss and the painful memories. Comfort them too and continue to uphold them by thy grace and spirit every day. Bless our schools, Lord, that we are thankful for them. As we will give soon in the offering, we do this out of thankfulness to Thee for Thy great blessings. For teachers who love the truth, for teachers who give their lives for the cause of instructing our children, devote themselves to grow in the knowledge of Thee and of the creation and ever to impress upon the covenant seed the greatness of our God, the high calling that our children have to serve Thee, giving to them to know Thee and to know what it is to live as covenant children in the midst of this world. We thank Thee for them. Continue to give us, teachers. So many are the needs, once again, that the schools face, and we pray that Thou wilt meet those needs with godly teachers who are prepared by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, to be faithful instructors of the covenant youth. Bless our children. Keep them firm and secure in the truth of Jesus Christ. That they have a love for thee and a love for thy truth and a commitment to it, and that they show their love for thee by a godly walk and by embracing the truth and confessing it when they come to the years of discretion that they They make their choice consciously by the power of thy grace, fearlessly in the face of opposition of the world and the ridicule of the world that they yet desire to confess the name of Jesus Christ. And so grant us a blessing in the way of obedience, faithful instruction in the home and school and catechism class here in the pulpit. Bless our pastor Use him mightily in all the ways that a pastor is used. And bless him this week too as he brings comfort. As he carries out the duties that every pastor must perform. In joys and in sorrows. 
use him for the blessing of the church of Jesus Christ. Supply, therefore, every need that he has. We ask, Lord, thy blessing, therefore, upon us. Keep us in thy care in this week. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We worship the Lord in the giving of our offerings, the first collection for Heritage Christian School and the second for the Protestant Reformed Scholarship Fund for teachers and ministers. Psalter number 365, 365, versification of the psalm from which the text is taken. From the depths my prayer ascendeth unto God on high. Hear, O Lord, my supplication and my cry. The four stanzas, 365.
The text for the sermon tonight, as I announced, is Psalm 130, the first three verses. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the words of the psalmist and the text that we consider tonight are our words. I preached on this text in other contexts when I had to try to almost convince the people, almost bring them to the point that they could say, yes, this is This is what I'm seeing. But tonight, these are our words. Death has come into this congregation, taking a member of the congregation not only, but a husband and a father and grandfather, a brother and a son of people that we know and people that we love. And death is cold and death is harsh. It's an enemy that tears apart the very fabric of our lives. It is sudden and unexpected. No one, no one of all the people that knew Bruce expected that he wouldn't be in church today, that he wouldn't be around any longer. It is absolutely sudden and unexpected. It is powerful. No one can overcome death. No one can hold on to his own soul. When death comes, death conquers. And it's final. Absolutely final. Separating us from someone that we know and love For the rest of our life on this earth, there is that absolute separation. Tonight we deal with this. We deal with the loss that God brings upon us as a congregation. And the believer, in his sorrow and his loss and his pain, can be pressed down, as surely the family is tonight, So that he cries out with the psalmist, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Clearly the psalm is a prayer to God. It's a prayer. A prayer of a believer in deepest distress. It is an urgent cry. Out of the depths of despair he cries out. Unto God. He is experiencing obviously overwhelming troubles and overwhelming sorrows in his life. But there's more to it than merely the troubles and the sorrows that the psalmist is experiencing, because the psalmist is a believer who has taken stock of himself, taken stock of his life of his own situation, and he has looked at himself. He's looked at himself, and he has seen the true cause of his misery. The Heidelberg Catechism does that. Every time we go through the Heidelberg Catechism, we come to those first few Lord's Days, and the Lord's Days explain what is the real reason for your misery. What, what's the true cause here? And the psalmist says, rather the Heidelberg Catechism, and the psalmist says, it's you. It's your sin. It's your guilt before God. That's the cause of your true misery. It's your own sin. The psalmist has faced that. 
in all the troubles, yes, he has troubles, he has things that are pressing him down so terribly hard that he can cry out the words of the psalm, but it isn't merely the troubles of life, it isn't merely the sorrows of life, finally. It is his guilt that is the most horrible weight pressing him down. We pray the same words tonight. And for us too, our cry from the depths must not be merely because of the sorrow of the heaviness of death. That is part of it. That surely may be and is a part of the cry of the believer. It is. But our cry too must arise out of our recognition of our own state. Our sin. The reality is that the experience of great adversity in our life and the knowledge of our sin very, very often come together. Because tragedies and heavy strokes that God lays upon us, whether it be as an individual or a family or a congregation, those heavy strokes that God lays upon us has a way of drawing attention to our sinfulness and calling attention to our spiritual wretchedness, not only our physical or our emotional distress, but our, our spiritual wretchedness. It's out of that consciousness. Yes, it's the weight of the troubles of life, but it's also the consciousness of our own sinfulness that we cry out with the psalmist out of the depths. Surely God always has many, many reasons for everything and anything that He does. So many good purposes that He accomplishes. And the death of Bruce is no exception to that. God has many, many different reasons. Death always forces us as believers to look at ourselves a bit more carefully, to inspect our lives, to sift through our secret thoughts and our motives and our attitudes, to examine our goals in life, to see really what treasures have we been storing up and what is the path that we've been walking and where really is our heart? Is it here on the earth or is it where it ought to be in heaven? And, and death reminds us that all too often it's right here in this life and it it isn't where it ought to be in heaven. But death reminds us that this life is not our home. It isn't. This world is not our home. We're on our way to our eternal home. A much, much better place. So God does that for us this week. And He does much more than that. Touching us in different ways in our lives. But we also face a week of self-examination. And those two things fit together really very well. If you think about it, they do. It will be our task as fellow believers, by God's grace, to examine ourselves in the light of God's Word and to make the words of the text, our own. To cry out to God after we see what is our condition, that we live in a life that is only a continual death, and that we see our guilt in that. Our guilt in Adam. Our guilt in our own sins. And our wretched condition. And we have to come to that. We have to come to understand why the psalmist cries this cry and, 
why we cry this cry. And if we do not come to that point, then stay away from the table. Stay away, because you will only eat and drink judgment to yourself. So with that, let's consider this text under the theme, A Cry from the Depths. A cry from the depths. We'll notice, first of all, an anguished cry. Secondly, a humble confession. And finally, an urgent plea. An anguished cry. Children, you know what anguish means? Anguish means pain. This is a painful cry. This is a cry of someone who is in misery. That's an anguished cry. This is a cry, says the text, from the depths. And you understand that's a picture, that's a figurative language expression from the depths, from the depths. You understand that has to do with someone that's down, down deep into something. It usually refers to the depths of the sea. It could be used, therefore, to describe someone who is calling out from the midst of the waters of the sea and he is drowning He's drowning. He's going under. Yes, he cries out in despair because he knows his life is coming to an end. And no matter how he struggles, it seems that things only get worse for him. That the waves of sorrow roll over his head. Such a one is pushed down. Such, such a one is under the sea cast down by the storm that rages around him and by the waves that roll over his head one after another. This is the way the scriptures use it. It's translated sometimes even deep waters, deep waters. This is the way you find it in Psalm 69. We read in Psalm 69, I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. And again in verse 14 of that same Psalm 69, Deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me, and out of the deep waters. The deep waters of Psalm 69, first of all, is the dreadful hatred of all his enemies that surround the psalmist. Bitter hatred, shocking hatred, hatred that comes at him wave after wave to destroy him. And so the idea of being in the depths is being at your absolute lowest point that you've ever been in your whole life, the very bottom, when you are in despair. Maybe because of the hatred of those that are around you that seek to destroy you. Maybe because of simply a multitude of troubles that you simply can't see your way through all of the troubles that are pressing in upon you. Maybe it's the overwhelming sorrow of death. But it's the depths. It describes a man also who is experiencing the wrath of God. That too is in Psalm 69, because there actually the, the final, the, the ultimate reference there is not David in his misery and trouble with the enemies, but it's Jesus. Psalm 69 is messianic very much. It describes Jesus in his crucifixion. That's what it is. The waves of God's wrath coming upon him. Jonah uses it the same way. In Jonah chapter 2, when Jonah is delivered, he, he describes, no rather it's before his deliverance, he prays unto God out of the fish's belly. And this is what he has to say. I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, that is out of the grave, I cried, and thou heardest my voice, for thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas and the floods compassed me about all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight 
Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. It was God's wrath. He deserved that. He knew that. God was angry with him for disobeying God and running from the command to go to Nineveh. God's wrath is a burning hatred of sin. Every time God's holiness encounters wrath, there is this, rather, every time God's holiness encounters sin, there is this reaction, this response of wrath that God has against all iniquity, all sin. And God's wrath is infinite. There is no limit to God's wrath because there is no limit to the holiness of God. It is infinite. And therefore that wrath of God overwhelms in dread terror. Anyone who is under the focus of the wrath of God is simply pressed down into the depths. The psalmist finds himself in the depths. We do not know exactly the circumstances of the psalmist. Troubles, maybe enemies that surrounds him, maybe the sword within his own family, his own son rising up. That's about as low a point as you can get. And then the nation of Israel divided into two camps in civil war with his son leading one half and another group following him. That's about as low as you could get. Maybe it's the death of a loved one. Maybe it's severe depression. The psalmists sometimes talk about depression that he has experienced. Psalm 42, Psalm 43, horrible depression that seems like he's never going to get out of it. Maybe it's a time like that. Maybe he faces death himself. But he's overwhelmed by it. He's overwhelmed by his troubles, and he's overwhelmed and convicted by his own sin and his own sinfulness. Because he understands that there's a connection between the adversities of life and sin. He understands there is a connection. A connection between sin and God's wrath. And troubles in this life remind him of God's wrath. In the first place, that's true because all afflictions in this life are a result of sin. Adam's sin. All the sickness, all the pain, all the heartache, all the fighting in life is written in Adam's sin. He knows that. Before sin, there was no death, there was no sickness, there was no cancer, there were no heart attacks, none of that. Not before Adam sinned, but because of Adam's sin, curse, the God's curse came upon the whole creation, and death came upon the whole creation, and all the misery and the sorrow of death. The psalmist understands that, that's why in our lives too, when afflictions come upon us, we're reminded of sin. Just in a general way. Now to be clear on that, it doesn't mean that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence that whenever you commit a sin, then there's an adversity that comes upon you. And that whenever there is an adversity, then you have to say, well, what is the sin that God is punishing me for? It isn't that. It isn't that. But in general... There wouldn't be any of the sorrows of life if it, were, if it were not for sin in this life. And yet God is terribly displeased with our sins. Heidelberg Catechism says that to us. He's terribly displeased with our sins because He's holy. If God could smile at sin, He wouldn't be a good God. He's holy, infinitely holy. And every one of our sins, says the Catechism, God will punish, both in temporal punishment and in eternal punishment. Every one of our sins. God said that to Israel when they were in distress. 
Through the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 30, verse 15, God said to Israel, Why criest thou for thine affliction? Why are you crying about your affliction? Thy sorrow is incurable for the multitude of thine iniquity. Because thy sins were increased, I have done these things unto you. And so again, in times of trouble, the believer looks at himself. He examines himself in the light of God's word and asks, is there a cause for this? Is God speaking to me not only in a general way of reminding me of the shortness of life and reminding me of my sins, but is he talking to me directly and chastising me for a particular sin that I must root out of my life? There are times that God does that too, chastises us for particular sins. But even if it isn't for a particular sin, there's always sin. And so the psalmist, from the depths of his afflictions, has appraised his own spiritual condition, as, and he's reminded, I am a vile sinner. I am born in sin. I continually sin against God. My very nature is prone to to sin against God, and those sins separate me. They separate me from the love of God. I don't experience the love of God. Never. I know He doesn't take it away, never, but I don't experience that. I'm experiencing instead His disfavor, and that's horrible to me, to live that way. He cries out, therefore, from the depths, even in despair, under the pain of separation from the love of God and even feeling the rejection of God, experiencing the wrath of God against sin because He does, God does have wrath against our sins. He does. And He cries out for mercy. Who is this? Well, we have to see that this is a repentant child of God. It's not the godless of this world. Even though from a certain point of view, they are in the depths. They are under the curse and wrath of God. The Bible says the curse of God follows them wherever they go, even into their home. The curse of God is there. The curse that, sa the curse that says, you will die. That's a horrible thing, to be under the curse of God. And they know that when they get up in the morning, God's curse is there and the wrath of God is revealed against all iniquity and all ungodliness and every bad thing that happens to them is just another judgment from God that is dragging them down closer to the grave and finally to hell. They know that. God is against them. They are in the depths. But they will not cry to God. They hate God. They hate Him with all their being. They will shake their fist in the face of God even on their deathbed. They will not cry out to God for mercy. This cry is not the cry of the ungodly. It's not the cry of an impenitent believer, an impenitent child of God. He too is in the depths. He's forsaken the law of God. He's returned to the bondage of sin. He's immersed himself once again in the horrible sins that he once left from which he was once delivered. He now loves his sins. He's hardened against the word of God. Admonitions that come to him from the word of God, he casts them away in disdain. He will not listen. God's chastening hand is heavy upon him. His sins cut him off from any favor of God. And he is pining under the wrath of God. But in his impenitence, so long as he lives that way, he will not cry out to God. He will go on. He will not even admit that they are from God. He won't admit that God is chastising him. The cry is not from the godless and it's not from the impenitent child of God and it's not from the self-righteous Israelite either. There are those. They trust in themselves. Their trust is in their ability to keep 
the law of God. They're in the depths too, from a certain point of view, because they have no assurance of salvation. They delude themselves maybe into thinking that they don't have to worry about hell because they're good enough, but God does not give them any assurance of salvation. The only thing that God ever does is turn his face away from that. In anger, he chastises them. He punishes them. But they will not cry out to God the way the psalmist does here because to do that would be to have to admit that they are not measuring up to the standards of God's law. Their prayer is not, I cry out from the depths. Their prayer is, Oh God, I thank Thee that I am not as other men are. Now this is a cry of a repentant believer. And that's evident from the fact that even in his deepest woes, his troubles, he calls on God. He doesn't rely on himself. He doesn't rely on his friends. They may be powerful, they may be influential, but that's not the person that he calls to. He calls only on God in his despair. And he calls him Lord. Lord. And when you call God Lord, you are acknowledging that God is sovereign over all the affairs of your life. That God's hand is the one that is squeezing him. That God's hand is the one that is resting heavily upon him. And that all of the troubles and all of the afflictions that are coming upon him are from God. He's Lord. And a repentant believer is somebody who has seen his sins. Who recognizes what he is, and how he has offended God, and how guilty he is before God. And he is grieved. He's grieved by that. And he's also convinced by faith that he will find forgiveness. He has to believe that. To be able to come to God in the depths of despair, Despair not merely because of trouble, but despair because of the sinfulness and the guilt that we bear. To be able to go to God, you can only go with the confidence of faith that you will find forgiveness there. Otherwise, why go? Otherwise, the psalmist would run. He would be like Adam in the Garden of Eden. He would try to hide himself. He would try to make excuses for himself. But he doesn't do that. He cries for help. But you understand and, and you recognize that this isn't only the cry of a believer, a repentant believer, but this is ultimately the, the cry of Christ himself. In fact, they must first be the cry of Christ who now is inspiring the psalmist to cry out this way. Listen to the, the words of the text and think of Christ. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. He was in the depths, the pit of hell, as no one ever has and not even anyone ever will experience it. To be under the wrath of God after he has been in the presence of God, enjoying his fellowship and favor, to be under the wrath of God for the sins not only not, not the sins of his own, but not the sins of not merely one individual as those in hell will bear that wrath, but to bear the wrath against the sins 
of a multitude that cannot be counted against all the sins of his people. That's the depth into which Jesus Christ was plunged and from which he cries out. God had cast him away, as it were, out of his presence. Wave after wave after wave of God's infinite wrath poured over his head. Jesus says, I cry from the depths. I cry for deliverance. I cry for evidence of the favor of God here in the pit of hell. I cry for mercy, O oh God. O oh God, in wrath, remember mercy. That's the cry of anguish. And thus the repentant believer also makes a humble confession of his sin. He acknowledges his guilt. We read that in verse 3. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? The word iniquities is a common word in the Old Testament for sin. It means to make crooked to bend something and make it crooked. No longer straight as the law of God is, but something that is crooked and perverse. And that it means to do something perverse. Scripture describes dreadful sins with this word. It describes the evils of the, of the Canaanite idolatry, and the immorality in which they live, for which cause God destroyed them. That's the word the psalmist uses here. It describes the sins of Eli's sons who were cut off out of Canaan. That's the word the psalmist uses here. This is the word that describes David when he went directly against what God commanded, directly against what Joab admonished him, and he numbered the people in his pride. This is the word that is used here. He was crooked. The psalmist, the point I'm making here is the psalmist is in no way making light of his sins. If thou shouldest mark iniquities, those crooked and perverse activities, not only but crooked and perverseness that makes up our nature. He confesses, I am evil. I am crooked and perverse. I sin. And therefore I am guilty before God. I am guilty. I deserve His wrath. I deserve His judgment. I destroy. I deserve to be destroyed. He knows that God is a righteous God. He knows that God cannot approve evil. He knows that God judges with an absolute perfect judgment. And every sin must be punished. Otherwise, God is not God and God is not righteous. Every sin must be punished. And this also, take note of this. He views his iniquities not in comparison to those people over there and that person over there and comparing himself to them, but he takes note of his iniquities in the light of God's righteousness. That's the only way we can ever examine ourselves. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, God is the judge. His standard is what holds with regard to our sins. To mark is to watch, to observe, and to keep something. And it means if God would be rigid in His law and in His punishments, 
if he would keep track of every sin that we commit and would visit every sin that we commit with the punishment that it deserves, if God would do that, we would all be destroyed. We would be destroyed. Anybody who appeared before God would simply be cast out into hell. Who could stand? Who? That's his rhetorical question. The answer being obviously, no one. No one could stand if God would mark every sin and visit it with the appropriate punishment. It's apparent that the psalmist does not trust his righteousness to cover anything that he's done. He doesn't bring his works to God and ask that those works kind of be weighed over against the evil that he's done and then maybe they'll kind of balance each other out. He doesn't bring a single thing from his own works or life. If thou didst mark, that's all he cares about. He stands before God. God is the judge. He puts himself in God's hand. That, of course, raises a bit of a question when he says it that way. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, doesn't God mark iniquities? Surely God knows everything. He knows the secret thoughts of our hearts. He knows the secret activities of our life. He knows the things we do in public and private. He knows it all. And, and God cannot forget what we've done. That's impossible for God to do. And besides, do not we have the testimony of the New Testament that in the day of judgment, every man will be judged according to his own work? So what does the psalmist mean here when he says, if thou shouldest mark? Well, in the first place, he means that in our day-to-day -day living, God does not, as we just pointed out, God does not bring the punishment that each sin deserves upon our head. He does ch chastise us. He does. But you understand that the penalty for sin, even the smallest sin, if I may put it that way, the penalty for even the smallest sin is death. And if God would therefore deal with us according to our sins, we would be destroyed immediately. Just one sin would mean we deserve to die and then not only the grave but hell. Obviously, God does not do that. We should hang our heads in shame. Because when God sometimes touches us and brings affliction on us, then we're so quick to think, I don't deserve such a heavy blow here. Why am I being given such a hard time in my life? When the reality is we deserve far, far worse than we ever receive in this life. Even... If God takes a loved one through death, even that. So that in the first place, if thou shouldest mark transgressions, he doesn't visit us with the punishment we deserve for the sins that we commit, though he may chastise us. Secondly, even the wicked do not experience the fullness of God's wrath for the sins that they commit, not in this life, not yet. God holds back. We call that in our catechism class the forbearance of God. God forbears. He does not pour out all His wrath on the reprobate ungodly. Not in this life. He holds back. They will experience it. When the world goes through a horrible time in their life and they blaspheme and they say, I have been through a living hell, they haven't been. They do not know yet. 
the dreadfulness of hell. God does not visit upon them in this life what they deserve. But most importantly, the psalmist means by this, God will never deal with us as we deserve. He never will. He holds back in his long suffering to us. He never gives us what we truly deserve according to our life and according to our sinful nature. He does not punish us with wrath, with that killing wrath. The wrath of God on the wicked is a destroying wrath. Even the wrath that we have in this life. And God does become angry and we experience His wrath. But it's not a killing wrath. It's a chastising wrath intended to draw us back to Him. Not intended to destroy us. He never gives us what we deserve according to our own works. The psalmist knows that. And he knows the reason for that. And the reason for that is that God has promised a Savior who will save him, the psalmist, Israel, us, save us from the wrath of God that we so much deserve. That all our guilt and all our sins will be placed on that one. And he didn't understand how exactly that would happen because he could only see the pictures. He could see the lamb that was brought to the altar and the man's hand laid on the lamb and the guilt of the man and his family put on the lamb and then the lamb killed in his place. We, of course, see the reality in Jesus Christ. And the psalmist knows, nonetheless, But this is the case. God does not mark iniquities. For His people, they're not kept on them. God, in His long-suffering, does not bring His wrath upon His people as they deserve. Only a believer could make this kind of a statement. Only a believer can have this kind of confidence crying out of the depth with every indication in his life that God is against him. Only he can be confident and say, I will not be destroyed because God does not mark my iniquities. And yet... Even with such confidence, it's still an urgent plea. It's an urgent plea. The urgency is evident from the fact that over and again he calls on God. He uses the names of God repeatedly. He is crying out to Him. Out of the depths have I cried unto Thee, O Lord, Jehovah that is. Lord, hear my voice. If Thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? And that He cries. This is urgent. And that He says in verse 2, Hear, hear my voice. And let Thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. He cries out from the depth, with all urgency. He is near the end, as far as he is concerned. Emotionally and physically and spiritually, he is in the depths. He is as a man that is drowning, a man that knows that any moment he could slip under and lose it all. He cries out urgently. And obviously he wants deliverance. He wants salvation. Salvation and deliverance from the troubles of life if God will be pleased to bring that upon him. But deliverance and strength to go on. Strength to go on in this life. And especially deliverance from the misery of sin and death. He needs the assurance that he is forgiven. That God is not against him in his troubles. That is key. He needs 
the assurance that in all of the troubles of life, God is not against him. As a child who has sinned and been punished by his father, needs the assurance that his father loves him. So the psalmist. Is there any hope that he will receive it? There surely is. The psalmist doesn't have any hope in himself, obviously. We've already pointed that out. He's not, he's not bringing some kind of a reason why God ought to hear him from the depths. But it's in God himself. It's in the names. Those very names that God is the Lord. That as Lord, He is sovereign. That as Lord, He has the whole of the life of the psalmist in His hand. All these circumstances are in God's hand. He acknowledges that. God is the one bringing these things. God is the only one who can deliver Him. The only one. But He's also Jehovah. The I Am. The changeless I am the one who said, I am Jehovah, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. And the psalmist grabs hold of that because God has revealed to the psalmist his love in the past. And if God is changeless, he loves me still. That cannot be lost. He loves me still. And God has promised salvation. And those promises cannot fail. God promised salvation through a Messiah who would redeem them from sins. A Messiah who would redeem and save Israel from all their enemies. And of course we've seen how God did this. By God himself coming into the flesh, becoming one with us. God coming in the flesh so that our guilt could be put upon Him. We were one with Him because we were chosen in Him in all eternity and therefore it was perfectly right and just for God to take our sins and put them upon Jesus. All those who are in Him have their guilt put on Him that He might pay for those sins. He went to the depths of hell to pay for those sins. And he accomplished it. And therefore the very next verse in the psalm, there is forgiveness with thee. There is forgiveness. Because of that promised Messiah. That's the confidence we have. Today, Yes, even in a time of sorrow, we have that confidence. And that's the confidence we have as we examine ourselves. That's not such a nice thing to do, you know, examine yourself. Look at your motives and your thoughts and your way of life and your goals and your hopes and your dreams and where are you going because you see so terrible, terribly much sin. And we'd have to do that in the light of God's Word. And come to the point, too, where we cry out with the psalmist for mercy. For mercy. Because we do this knowing that God is not against us. We don't start out wondering whether God is for us. We don't start out thinking, God is against me. We start out with the confidence God is our God. He is for us. And all the afflictions of life do not change that. And coming to God and opening up our heart and our rottenness and exposing that to the light of God's Word and confessing our sins, that doesn't change that. He loves us still.
And we know, therefore, we'll be able to come to the table of the Lord with rejoicing, with joy, that He does deliver us out of the depths of our troubles and our sin. He does remove the sting of death and the grave because He did that in Jesus Christ. There is our hope. There's our comfort. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank Thee for Thy goodness. What a treasure is Thy Word. How blessed it is to know that Thy saints have often themselves been in the depths Even the inspired saints have cried out to Thee from the depths. Thou dost always hear the cries of Thy people. Hear us. Show us our sinfulness. Show us the way of repentance. Give us the grace to repent as we need to. But always, Lord, with the blessed reminder that Thou art for us, and Thy way is to bring us unto Thyself. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Psalter number 426. 426. I love the Lord, the fount of life and grace. He hears my voice, my cry, and supplication. And then the psalmist goes into his experience. The cords of death held me in deep despair. The pangs of hell like waves by tempest driven and so on. I cried in verse stanza three and the Lord preserves. So the first four stanzas, one through four of 426.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.